Because of the Salebrus Church generosity, our church facility project is now fully funded. Gracias una vez más a la Iglesia Sellos Press por todo lo que han hecho. Que Dios les bendiga. Because of the Sabres Church generosity, our church project is now fully funded. Queremos agradecerles, hermanos, por su doble generosidad, su doble amor. Esperamos que a partir de aquí muchas personas conozcan a Cristo. Because of the same word, Job Generosity. And because of the same word, Shane Generosity. Because of the same word, Shane Generosity. Our church facility project is now fully founded. Is now fully founded. Is now fully founded. Thank you, Sagebrush. 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 Gracias, Sagebrush, for all of your nature. Thank you, Sagebrush. Well, I want to welcome everybody here today and everybody watching on TV and on the stream. We're glad you're a part of the Sagebrush family. Friends, you are doing some amazing things. As you just saw, all those different churches have now been fully funded. For those of you who are new, uh, we decided last year that we were going to uh, do a capital campaign and that every dollar that we raised would go overseas to start churches. And we're starting 59 churches in one year with all of our partners all around the world. It's very exciting. And we're getting pictures of now walls coming out of the ground. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to be showing you that as well. And when all these COVID test things don't have to be for international travel, we'll start our mission trips again so we can get you safely back home. And you'll get to go to these places, meet these people, worship with them under the facilities that you provided. Oh, it's just going to be very, very exciting uh, in the days ahead. I have a, a soccer ball. I had this a few weeks ago. We ran out of these. This is an opportunity for you to put a smile on a child in a third world country's face. Uh, these soccer balls we bought for $12.50. We're going to sell them to you for $25. How's that for a deal? Um, <laughs> We're going to double it up on you because for every soccer ball that you buy, we're going to make sure that a child in a third world country gets a soccer ball. And this is a way that we have sports ministry in all these different countries. These kids come, they play on teams, they hear about Jesus. Many of these kids give their lives to Jesus Christ. The whole trajectory of their life is changed, and it all starts with a donation of $25 for a soccer ball. Kids in third world countries dream of having a soccer ball like this. So if you want to pick one of those up today and bless a child, then you go out into the foyer and you buy a couple of soccer balls, all right? We're beginning a brand new series today called Identity Theft. I'm pretty excited about it. Take a look at this. Identity theft. It was a somewhat foreign term 30 years ago, but today it's far too common. Picture it. Someone claims to be you, begins to spend your money, destroys your credit and puts you in a deep financial hole. Before you know it, your loan to buy a house gets denied and you have tons of red tape to fight your way out of. According to the consulting firm Javelin Strategy and Research, 13 million consumers fell victim to it in 2019 and it cost three and a half billion dollars in out-of-pocket expenses. But there are other forms of identity theft Someone can claim to be you and get prescription drugs or other medical attention at your expense. They can make a counterfeit driver's license with your information and commit crimes as you. While these methods might be difficult for the average person to pull off, there is still another form of identity theft that has risen in popularity. It is fairly simple for some people to do and is more devastating than losing money. It's the identity theft of what social media can do to you. So if you've been around here for very long, you know that I'm not a huge fan of social media. I don't have a ticky talkie uh, I'm not over 60, so I'm not on Facebook. Um, <laughs> it's important that you understand that. Uh, I don't have an Instagram account. I don't have any, any of that, that kind of stuff. I'm not against social media, though. I mean, if you want to have that, I think that's great. If you want to have your ticky talkie and your snappy chatty and your Instagrammy and your Facebooky, I think that's fantastic. That's wonderful for you, and I hope you use that platform to influence people for Jesus Christ. I really do. Uh, I don't have any problem with any of that, except for this. I, I don't like what social media is doing to the psyche of people. Let, let, let me kind of explain, and, and you kind of track with me, if you would. 
you put a post together, you put a picture together, you put a reel together, and you're so into social media and what everybody else thinks of you on social media that you kind of watch that post. And if you get lots of likes, you get lots of follows, you get lots of shares, you get some comments along the way that are positive, encouraging, and firming to you, you start to feel good about yourself, right? I think just about every person who puts a post out is kind of hoping that post goes viral. You know, I think this is the one. I think this is going to be the personal best right here. So we put those posts out, and what do we do? We check on that post throughout the day. After 30 minutes, we check on it, see how well it's doing. An hour goes by, two hours, we check on it again. And if it's doing well, then we feel really good about ourselves. And if it's not doing so well, we're like, what's the matter with my post? Why, isn't people, why aren't people enjoying my post today? Why aren't people liking my post? And you begin to look at the people who liked your post, and you say, well, I appreciate those people. But then you look at your list of followers and all those people that aren't liking that post, and you're like, I don't understand that. Because that friend of mine last week, I liked their post, and their post was stupid. Stupid. She doesn't even know how to take a selfie. You understand what I'm saying? And so I liked it anyway because I felt sorry for her. She could at least like my post back, right? Then you check it one moment and there's a comment on your post. You're like, what'd they say? What'd they say? What'd they say? And so you read it and it doesn't make any sense to what you posted. And you're like, what's wrong with this person? And then they put an emoji at the end of the sentence and the emoji has nothing to do with what they just, and you're like, these people don't even know how to use emojis. Some of you are sitting here going, what's an emoji? I don't even know what that is, to be honest with you. And your self-esteem and the way you feel about yourself is all wrapped in this social media account. Now, here's the question I got to ask you. Do you want to give people that kind of power? Do you want to pass that kind of power as to how you feel about your life? Do you want to pass that on to somebody else? Who in one moment's time where you can be a hero and turn into a, a zero. Do you want to give other people that kind of power in your life? There, there was this woman. She said, you know, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of how social media makes me feel. And so she wrote a letter to the fear of what other people think. This is what she wrote. Dear fear of what others think, I am sick of you, and it's time we broke up. I know we've broken up and gotten back together many times, but seriously, fear of what others think this is it. We're done. I'm tired of overthinking my status updates on Facebook, trying to sound more clever, funny, and important. I'm sick of feeling anxious about what I say or do in public, especially around people I don't know that well, all in the hope that they'll like me, accept me, praise me. I run around all day feeling like a golden retriever with a full bladder. Like me, like me, like me, like me. Because of you, fear of what others think, I go through my day with a cloud of shame hanging over my head, and I never stop acting. I never stop acting. The spotlight's always on, and I'm center stage, and I better keep dancing, posturing, posing, or else the spotlight will move, and I'm sure I'll dissolve into a little meaningless puddle on the ground like that witch in The Wizard of Oz. I can never live up to the expectations of my imaginary audience. Let me read that again. Friends, you will never live up to the expectations of your imaginary audience, the one that lives only in your head but whose collective voice is louder than any other voice in the universe. So eat it. Fear of what others think. You and I are done. And no, I'm not interested in talking it through. I'm running, jumping, laughing you out of my life once and for all. Or at least, that's what I really, really want. God help me. I know people that get up in the morning and, and their first thought is what I'm going to post. So I can get that adrenaline rush. So I can feel accepted. So I can feel secure in who I am. Because you are just inundated with what everybody else says about you and what everybody else thinks of you. Of course, that's not the only place where we lose our identity, is it? Just on social media. We live in a culture where we've lost our identity. My goodness, the culture that we live in is more about uh, outward appearance than it is about inward character. I read some interesting statistics this past week. Did you know that women spend $1,800 a year on clothes? Some of the men are like, uh, I think that's a little short, Todd, to be honest with you. 
Well, guys, it doesn't include purses and shoes, okay? $1,800 in clothes. Average woman spends $1,380 on makeup. Do you know that's a lot of money right there? $1,000, $1,300. And now, listen, I'm not against makeup. If you want to wear makeup, I'm, I'm not against you wearing nice clothes. Here's my problem. It's when you base how you feel about yourself on how you look on the outside. Because isn't there a greater beauty? Isn't there a deeper beauty? The, the beauty of, of a godly woman standing before her Lord? I found this interesting. 25% of men and 45% of women go on diets on a daily basis. Now, if that statistic is true, after four days, we should all be on a diet. But you and I both know we don't last that long when we go on a diet, right? I found this interesting. 50% of women say that uh, they've been criticized enough to change their appearance. 50% said that. The other 50% were lying. <laughs> 83% of women say they feel too much pressure to improve their appearance. They say they hate how society puts the pressure on them to look a certain way. They feel the pressure day after day after day. But 85% of women believe that beauty is power. Now, talk about a loss of identity. I hate what society is doing to me. I hate what society is pressuring me to be. But boy, I tell you what, beauty is power. That's a loss of identity. It's not just for women. It's for men, too. They go to the gym. They pump the weights. They get the six-pack abs. They want people to notice them, to look at them. They buy the nicest cars. They have that midlife crisis. They're driving around a sports car with the top down with no hair. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen these people <laughs> around, right? Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's what they're, they're, they're crying out. And as a result, they, they lose their identity. We care so much about what other people think that we lose who we are. Dr. Charles Cooley, the Dean of American Sociology, said this about self-esteem. He said, our self-esteem is determined to a large degree by what we think the people or the persons that matter the most to us thinks about us. Whoever is the most important person in your life, whatever that person thinks of you, is probably the way that you feel about yourself. Now, think about the ramifications of that statement. Whoever you believe is the most important person in your life, their voice in your life has more power than anybody else's voice. So if your mom or your dad is the most important person in your life, well, guess what, parents? You have an unbelievable responsibility. Because you can build that child up or you can tear that child apart because your words hold more weight than anybody else's words on the face of the earth. Think about the ramifications if you're a coach or if you're a boss and someone looks up to you and admires you. Your words can help them reach new heights or you can bring them down to the lowest depths. Think about this when it comes to dating relationships, for example. My goodness, if the most important person in your life has the greatest influence, no wonder so many couples are having sex before marriage. Because they think they have to, because they want to please their partner. They want to please the person that they're with, right? If the most important person in your life is your wife or it's your husband, you have incredible power over your spouse. And you can bring words of life to them, or you can destroy them with a careless word. What's the biggest factor that parents of teenagers are worried about? It's the friends that their kids choose, right? Because we know that when their friends are the most powerful voice in their life, that kids will compromise their values. They'll compromise anything to be a part of that friend group. Because deep down inside, every single one of us has this deep longing to be loved and to be accepted. So we walk around with all this pretense, right? Acting like we've got it all together. Acting like we're so secure. But we're not. We're broken. And we're insecure. And we come to church. Gosh, a place where we should let our defenses down and really reveal who we really are. And we put on a mask here as well. We say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, if I was any better, I'd be twins, right? That's the kind of silly stuff we say around here. But you're not fine. Truth be told, the truth is rarely told. You rarely tell it even to yourself. Well, the band's going to sing this song. It's one of my all-time favorite songs. Kind of my theme song, to be honest with you, over, uh, since it came out. Because 
I struggle with insecurity. And I struggle with what other people think of me. So I'm going to listen to this song. We're going to listen to the words. And I'm going to come back. And then I'm going to share with you where our identity should come from. Listen to the words of this song. Line number one, you're supposed to have it all together When they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them never better Line number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors Truth be told, the truth is really told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. And being honest is the only fix it there's no failure to fall there's no sin you don't already know so let the truth be told there's a sign on the door says come as you are i doubt it because if we live like that was true every sunday morning pew would be crowded Didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred and the prodigals like me. But truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Oh, am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine. So we say, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. But I'm not. I am broken. And I'm broken because I'm not listening to the only voice that really matters. Here's what's interesting. If you're a Christian, shouldn't the voice that matters more to you than any other voice be the voice of Jesus? And shouldn't what he has to say about you matter more than what someone posts about you or how you look on the outside? Shouldn't what he has to say about you and what he's declared you to be, shouldn't that be the defining things of your life? I have struggled with this issue of my life for, from, from, from the very beginning. And it is the word of God that has been my shelter, that has been my refuge in the midst of the storms. I mean, when you put yourself in the public eye, you get nailed an awful lot. 
And it's easy for you to start to believe some of the mean things that people say. It's easy for you to get to a place where you begin to second guess even your worth as a human being. But it's what Jesus has to say that matters the most. So I'm hope, hopeful that during this little series that you will start to care more about what the Lord thinks of you than what anybody else has ever said of you because what he says about you is the absolute truth. We're going to look at a passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 1. And there's three truths that I want you to get and I want you to have these truths soak into your soul. First thing, write this down. We are chosen by God to have a relationship with him. We are chosen by God to have a relationship with him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So the first thing I want you to get in your head is that God chose you. God chose you. Have you ever been chosen before? I remember uh, elementary school, and the thing that we looked forward to more than anything was recess. And we'd run outside, and the girls would head to their side of the playground. The guys would head over to their side of the playground. We always played kickball. It was a lot of fun. We'd line up in a single file line. We'd pick a couple of captains. We'd play the guess the number game. Whoever got closest to the right number, they get to pick first. And then one by one by one, we would pick our team. Now, I never fully understood what it must have felt like for the kids who were picked at the very, very last. And we were brutal. I mean, as elementary school kids, we weren't even thinking about the words that we were saying and how devastating those must have been to the kids who had to hear them. Because there were kids that would come over to play kickball just to kind of hang out and be a part of the community, but they were terrible. I mean, they couldn't kick a ball to save their life. Do you understand what I'm saying? They were an easy out. They couldn't even kick it past the pitcher. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I always thought to myself, why are these kids even over coming over here to play? So we line up. I pick this person. I pick this person. I pick this person. Then we get down to the last couple. There's Billy and there's Johnny. Which one do you want? They're both terrible. They're both easy outs. Which one do you want? I don't care which one. They're about the same. Never thinking what that was doing to them. Because I never was picked last. Never understood it. Until I was picked last. In my neighborhood, I was the youngest kid, and I hung around with my brother, and I hung around with my brother's friends, and they were two, three years older than me, and they were a good foot taller than me and 30 pounds heavier than me, and we liked to play tackle football. Well, I don't know if you know this, but when you're a small little guy, you're not really a devastating person on the football field. And so we would line up in this old abandoned lot that was there in my neighborhood, and they would pick captains, and they would do the guess the number game, and then they would begin to pick back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I can't even tell you the number of times I prayed to Jesus asking him to somehow get me picked not last. But it seemed like game after game, day after day, I kept getting picked last. And it was kind of affecting my psyche because I knew I was better than half the guys that were there. Why are you laughing? That's the truth. One day, my brother was the captain, so he won the guess the number game, and he did something that changed the trajectory of my life. With his very first pick, he said, I picked Todd, and you should have heard the guys. Ah, oh, I can't believe you're picking Todd, he's terrible. <laughs> and I remember walking over to my brother and saying, Jeff, don't waste your first pick on me. And I'll never forget what he did. He grabbed my shoulders. He put me behind his back as if to say, I've chosen you. You're on my team. Did you understand that God chose you? And when did he choose you? The Bible says before the creation of the world, he looked out and he said, I choose you, and I choose you, and I choose you, and I choose you. And why did he choose us? The Bible says so that we would be holy and that we would be blameless. What in the world does that mean? He chose us so we would be distinctive. So that we would shine like the stars in the heavens. That we would be the light of the world and that we would be the salt of the earth. That day that my brother chose me first, and by the way, he never did it again. So I don't want you to think he was. <laughs> Do you think I played my heart out for him? Do you think I gave my very best for him every single play? Because I was a first pick. 
So why did he choose us? So he'd be holy, so he'd be blameless, so that people would see what it's like to live your life for an audience of one. That our priorities would be his priorities, that our desires would be his desires, that the direction of our life would be the direction that he wanted for our life. My goodness, I'm chosen by the King of kings and by the Lord of lords. That should matter to you. That should make a difference to you. Let me give you the second thing, is that we're adopted by God to be in his family. Look at verse 5. It says, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In Roman culture, when their baby was born, it was up to the father whether he wanted to accept the child into the family or not. He would sit down in a chair, and they would bring the child out. After the mother had given birth, they would bring the child out, and they would lay the child at the father's feet. And if he felt like the child was acceptable to be a part of his family, he would pick the child up and welcome the child into his family. But if he didn't want the child, he would turn and he would walk away. And someone else would grab the child and take the child away. Now, this is sad, but this is true. In Roman culture in the first century, you know what many people did with girls? They abandoned them. Girls were not a a viable resource to the family. They couldn't work the fields for the most part. They were just a financial liability. And so she would give birth to a daughter. She would be a beautiful girl. They would lay it down at the father's feet. He'd say, it's a girl. And he would leave her. And someone would take the girl away. If a child was born with a physical deformity, if some kind of physical issue, guess what? He would reject that child also, and they'd be taken away. Where would they be taken? Well, in Ephesus, they'd be taken to the Agora. The Agora was the marketplace. They actually had a place in the marketplace for children who weren't wanted, and they would put those babies there. And then people throughout the day would take those babies. But they didn't take them home to adopt them. They took them home to sell them into slavery, and into prostitution. And it was thousands and thousands of children. You see, when you adopted someone in the first century, you gave that that child your last name. You let that child sit at your table and eat from your great banquet. You gave that child a fair share of the inheritance. It was your way of looking that child in the eye and say, the old is gone, the new has come. You're new now. This is your new identity. Isn't that what God did for us? We ask Jesus to come into our life, forgive us of our sin. He gives us a new identity. We now bear his name. And we will sit at his table, the great banquet table of God of every tribe and every nation and of every race. And we have a great inheritance. One day we're going to walk on streets of gold. And the old is gone. And the new has come. During the Korean War, American soldiers would have relationships with Korean women. These women would get pregnant and they would give birth to their sons and their daughters. And those children looked differently than the rest of the Korean people. Their skin would be a different color. Their hair would have a different curl to it. And many times, these children that were born to these Korean women were ostracized by society. In fact, many times, these women were cast aside by their own families. And it wasn't just a few people. It was thousands and thousands of them. And the American soldiers would eventually return home, and they would leave those Korean women and their children to face all that on their own. There's one Korean woman who was trying to raise her child because what happened many times was the Korean women, as soon as the soldier would leave, they would abandon their child in the streets. But this woman was trying to raise her child, and she made it through the first seven years. But the persecution and the insults and the way that she was treated and disregarded by society was more than she could bear. Can you imagine? But this mother looked her seven-year-old child and said, I don't want you anymore. And abandoned that child to the streets. And it was thousands and thousands of kids. They lived on the streets. They slept under bridges. This little girl somehow, someway made it for two years. Now she's nine years old. She ends up at a Christian orphanage. She's the oldest kid that is there. And she knows that her chance of ever being adopted into a family is slim and none. Well, rumor has it that there's an American couple that's coming into town, and they're going to adopt one of the Korean baby boys. And boy, she's so excited. Everybody's excited because this child's going to get a brand new lease on life. And so this nine-year-old girl on her own prepares and gets all those little baby boys ready to be viewed by this couple. This is what she writes about that encounter. She said, he walked in. It was like Goliath had come back to life. 
I saw that man with his huge hands lift up each baby, and I knew he loved every one of them as if they were his own. I saw tears running down his face, and I knew if they could, they would have taken the whole lot home with them. Then he saw me out of the corner of his eye. Now, let me tell you, I was nine years old, but I didn't even weigh 30 pounds. I was a scrawny thing. I had worms in my body. I had lice in my hair. I had boils all over me, and I was full of scars. I wasn't a pretty sight. But the man came over to me and rattled away in English, and I looked up at him, and then he took this huge hand of his and laid it on my face. He was saying, in effect, I want this child. And I just think that's what God does for us. He, he looks beyond our sin, looks beyond our scars, looks beyond the ugliness and all the damage that's been done to us, and he takes his huge hand and he caresses our face, and he says, I want you. I want you to be a part of my family. I want to do life together with you. I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. So you can have a new name. You can sit at the great banquet table. You can have a great inheritance. What in the world do you care what anybody else says or thinks? When you live your life for an audience of one, you find freedom. And your security is in your relationship with him, not in the relationship with others that's here today and gone tomorrow. Let me give you the third thing I want you to get, is that you're loved by God. Look at verse 4. It starts the passage. It says, God did all of this in his love. The pastor of the Almighty God Tabernacle Church was studying late one Saturday night. I guess he was doing a Saturday night special. He didn't get his sermon done during the week, so he's up late writing that thing out. It's about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night, and he needs to call his wife, tell her what's going on, because he's going to be there for a few more minutes. So he picks up the church phone, he dials the number, and the phone rings and rings and rings and rings and rings. Nobody answers the phone. He thinks that's very strange. Well, he hangs up the phone. He continues to work. Now it's about 10.45 at night. He's ready to close up shop for the night. And so he calls his wife one more time to tell him that, you know, she's, tell her that she, he's coming home. So he dials the number, and she immediately picks up. He said, well, this is weird. You immediately picked up, but just 30 minutes ago, it, it rang and rang and rang, and nobody answered. She said, it didn't ring here. Well, they thought that was kind of odd, but they didn't think much about it. He goes to bed that night. Next morning, goes and preaches his message, and then in the afternoon, he has a nice time with his family. And then now it's Monday morning, and the secretary is making a pot of coffee, and it's around 10 o'clock in the morning, and the phone begins to ring, so the pastor answers the phone. He says, Almighty God, Tabernacle Church. There was a pause on the other end. Man broke the silence. He said, uh, why, why, why did you call me on Saturday night? Pastor said, what, what, what in the world are you talking about? I can promise you that nobody called you Saturday night. He said, yes, you did. Somebody from this number called me Saturday night at 10 o'clock. It rang and it rang and it rang and it rang and it rang, but nobody answered. Pastor said, oh, I'm so sorry. I was calling my wife to tell her I was you know, finishing up and going to come home. I must have dialed the wrong number. I apologize. Long pause. Man said, Saturday night around 10 o'clock, I was going to end my life. And I prayed a little prayer. And I asked, I said, God, if you're real and if you love me and if you care about me, would you send me a sign? He said, almost immediately my phone began to ring. And it rang and it rang and it rang and it rang. And so I got up and I walked over to the caller ID and it said, Almighty God. <laughs> Could it be with 7 billion people alive on this planet that God cares so much about you that he has a pastor dial a wrong number just to get your attention to let you know that he loves you and he cares about you? My goodness, think about this. You're here today to hear this message, or wherever you're at. You might be watching from home, you might be on a treadmill, you might be driving your car, just keep driving your car, would you? <laughs> but in this moment in time, you came in here with all this baggage, or you tuned in with all this baggage and all this insecurity, and here you are hearing this message on this day, a message I have wrote years ago that was planned for this moment, in this day, exactly what you needed to hear. Could it be that God loves you that much that he does all of that to share with you these three truths? Friends, God chose you. 
God adopted you to be a part of his family, and he loves you with a never-ending love. And here's what I love, is that his love is not based upon your performance. Because some of you have kept an arm's distance away from the Lord because you think you have to perform to earn his love. He loves you because he is love. He loves you the way you are, and he loves you too much to leave you that way. And he wants to do life together with you. Think about this. God could spend his eternity with anyone he chooses to spend it with, and he's chosen to spend it with you. Slap that on your Facebook. Put that on your Instagram. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, truth be told, we have lost our way. And the voice that should matter and the truth we should hold on to is the truth that we ignore. Lord, I pray that we would care more about what you think than what anybody else thinks. That we are chosen, adopted, and loved by you. And there's nothing we can do that's going to change that. Because we've been grafted into your family. Lord, this next week, we're going to face difficulties. We're going to have moments when we question ourselves. Moments where we question our identity and who we are. I pray, Lord, that we would come back to this scripture and be reminded of your great love. Lord, for those who are here today or those who are at home, who needed this message. Lord, I pray that they would live it out and they would walk in newness of life, that they would finally find the freedom that's only found when we start living our life for you and for you alone. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.